This is The Crucible. The JRTC Experience. This is Conversations with the Enemy. In this series, we discuss Op 4 warfighting skills and lessons learned in a decisive action training environment for large scale combat operations at JRTC. Hi, I'm Colonel Matt Hardman, the Commander of Operations Group here at the Joint Readiness Training Center in Fort Johnson. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, we are fortunate. I've brought the nerds with us. And so we have some <laughs> electronic warfare experts. And one of them is a. Uh, a Geronimo soldier, uh, Chief Lair, and uh, Major Laplante. And so, Major Laplante, or Major Plant, would you uh, introduce yourself, please? Sir, Major Luke Plant, I am the SEMA OIC for Ops Group. SEMA is Cyber Electromagnetic Activities. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been here for two years now. It's my 17th rotation, sir. So, like, okay, what kind of nerd stuff do you do? Um, so, my background stuff, my background is in electromagnetic warfare, sir. So, EW uh, is, what I, is what I focus on. Um, that's that's my hobby is is, is focusing on EW sir and or signatures and did we get you out of a laboratory or where did you come from? You did not, sir. So so for my background is uh, I, I went to um, uh, West Point, graduated in two thousand eight. Uh, was a, an MP uh, initially, and I switched right. military police, sir. Okay. I was initially What'd military you major police. In West Point? Environmental engineering, sir. Okay. Yes. So I guess I started off a little nerdy, but um, environmental engineering is what I uh, what I focus on academically. Then I switched to, uh, after MPs, I switched to um, Functional Area 29, which was electronic, electronic warfare at the time. Um, uh, my first EW job was uh, in 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain. at Climb of Glory. Climb Glory, sir, 100%. It was at um, uh, Fort Drum up there before the 4th uh, before, uh, uh, Brigade, 10th Mountain here shut down. It was up, up so yeah. 310 up in um, Fort Drum. Um, and then I went to uh, uh, grad school. Uh, studied uh, environmental engineering at grad school to get my uh, master's degree. Then I went and taught at West Point in environmental engineering, so a little nerdy again. And then uh, I went back to 10th Mountain again by choice to Fort Drum uh, on division staff as a deputy CMO I see there. Um, and then uh, Functional Area 29 switched into and became part of the cyber branch, so now I'm a 17 Bravo, sir. And that was the job I had before here, and uh, I've been here for a couple of years now, sir. 17 rotations, so you've seen a lot. I've uh, seen a little bit, sir. All right, Chief. Uh, hello, <clears throat> I'm a CW2 Christian Lair. I'm from Florida. Uh, I enlisted in 2012 and transitioned to electronic warfare in 2016. And what'd you do? In th what'd you enlist as? Um, I <laughs> I was an EOD candidate, um, and I did not successfully complete that course. Um, so I was reclassed to 15 Papa. Uh, and I worked for First Brigade, 10th Mountain Division, doing Probably airspace clear uh, to the top, sir. <laughs> um, and I, I worked in their airspace clearance <clears throat> cell for three years. When did you get there? I was there 16, uh, sorry, 13 to 16, sir. Okay, we probably just missed each other. Potentially. I, 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 it was Colonel O'Donnell was my okay. brigade commander at, at 110. Um, then I transitioned to EW, uh, Electronic Warfare, in 16. I uh, did my first two years as an EWNCO in Korea. Um, shortly after that tour, I dropped a warrant officer packet. So, year group 19. Okay. Um, and how long have you been in Jerome? Just over a year now. So, okay. I think nine, nine or so rotations, give or take one or two. Okay, so I gotta ask uh, EW uh, folks, what are your hobbies? Uh, <laughs> Not a whole lot of hobbies, sir. To be honest, um, I like to I like to hike. I like to I like to play sports, um, but uh, yeah, not, not a whole lot, sir. Okay. Listen to audiobooks. Against the grain <laughs> podcasts. Podcasts, yes. What about you? Um, I'm in a punk rock band. You're in a punk rock band. All right, t give me your favorite three punk bands. Um, like the UK Subs, uh, the Clash is okay. Um, I was a huge fan of the Sex Pistols when I was a kid, but not so much anymore. John Lydon kind of fell okay. off a little bit, but um, you know, I grew up learning guitar, like listening to Green Day. So they're yeah. not really like 
you know, like punk, but yeah. they're, you know, that's what I got into yeah. as a so kid. Yeah, so one of the first shows I ever saw was Green Day at the Night Owl in Pensacola, and one of my best friends, Doug McFerrin fan, Voice of Man, opened for Green Day. Wow. Um, it's probably something so he'll remember Green forever. Day, like four times at the Night Owl concert. Okay, cool. What do you play? Um, I play every instrument in, in my band. So, so you're your it's, own band? It's a royal we, yeah. <laughs> yeah I love it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so not only can you come to Fort Johnson and join Geronimo, but we might be looking for people. What's the name of your band? I can't say. You can't say? I can't not say. on air? Not on air. Okay. <laughs> and you might join uh, Chief here in a band, which we won't say the name, um, you, you know, all, always, like, every day's open tryouts, right? Sure. Okay. You know, I've All got right. a lot of music on the internet. All right. Um. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, it's, it's interesting stuff and news. So, like, the first question, um, why do you cheat? Uh, <laughs> so there's, there's two answers to that question. There, there are two. It's a yes or no. There's, well, it's not a yes or a no. Well, it's, it's, true. A, it's, a, it's a why question. I guess if I said, do you cheat? Be grammatically yeah. incorrect. Yeah, no, you're okay, right. so okay. the. I shouldn't have tangled with a warrant. <laughs> right. There's, there's two answers there. Uh, they're short and kind of the expanded. So the, the short answer is that we don't cheat. Okay. We don't cheat. Um, the, the expanded, longer answer is if you want to discuss a battalion minus's ability to be consistently successful. Um, I think you have to examine two really important advantages that we have. I think the first one is home, home field advantage. Um, we're consistently out in the box 10 times a year. Barn land. Uh, right. <laughs> Tor <laughs> sometimes Torik, South Tor Torik, yeah. Tor o Ovana. Um, sometimes, sometimes South Torbia. Whatever the flavor of the month is, we're out there operating. Um, so our soldiers are incredibly proficient at fundamental soldiering tasks. Um, but I think something that's important that not a, a lot of people bring into the conversation is the repetitiveness that the staff goes through planning. And we, we start every rotation carte blanche. So um, we have become very proficient planning and rehearsing and executing, which is, you know, d during a staff ex, you might get good at a couple battle drills, um, you know, a live fire exercise. Your, your maneuver folks are going to get proficient in their, their skills, but rarely does any organization have the opportunity to go through the entirety of mission planning and execution the way that Geronimo does. Um, we're doing MDMP for the next rotation during the rotation that we're in. So it, the op tempo is high, but what we get out of that um, is a consistent mastery of just fundamental soldiering. Yeah, and so that gives you that gives you another advantage too, because like when you have a foundation of you're very very good at basic fundamental skills, it it allows you to actually you know you know what the box is, you know how the box is built, you know it's 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 dimensions completely, it's the material it's made out of. Now you can actually start to do some creative things. Right. Uh, we we can dissect a lot of things and and implement new solutions. And um, this is. The first organization that I've been a part of, and I've, I've never had a bad assignment, um, but I, I think the, the Army writ large, we talk about innovation and creativity and wanting to facilitate those things, um, you know, from the junior decision leader, or dis, junior decision maker all the way up. Um, I, I don't think we're necessarily awesome at facilitating that all of the time um, because we're not writ large, again, like good at fundamental soldiering. Um, you know, JRTC is a culminating exercise. I get to do it 10 times a year. So it, it's no, you know, it shouldn't be shocking that my team of electronic warfare professionals is more proficient than somebody else's. But what the 509th is able to do um, is come up with these unique and kind of tailored solutions per rotation that I have not had the opportunity to really uh, play with outside of the 509th. Yeah. So I, I think just the, the ability that we're able to quickly come up with solutions that are, that are unique and interesting um, you know, and potentially outpace what RTU is bringing to the fight is a, a really 
competitive edge that we have on top of home field advantage. Yeah, and I, I think you know the, the career, you're, you know, culturally this idea of creativity. Yeah, you know, everybody wants to be creative until it, it, you know, the answer to being good at being creative is like, hey, get really master the fundamentals and then come back to me and talk about this creative thing you want to do. Right. And uh, the sets and reps that uh, the 509th is able to get every single month means that, you know, you've got junior soldiers that have way more time in their equipment Absolutely. than a lot of other folks. Um, and, and that lends itself, you know, when you have the fundamental understanding, it lends yourself to, to being able to really come up with some creative things that we know are have a pretty good hypothesis are going to work because we're not, we have known variables. Sure. Right? And you, you, you guys have a sample size that's bigger than a lot of other units. Exceptionally large. Exceptionally <laughs> large sample size. Yes, sir. Right? Um, I mean, it's interesting. You know, people talk about, like, well, hey, I want to try this, like, thing. But when you don't understand what the box is, then you're really just kind of throwing stuff, yes. you know, against the wall and hoping it works. That's not what you guys are doing. So you I, guys have a pretty good basis of knowing what's probably going to work. Agreed, and hopefully, you know, anyone who's been here would would agree with that statement too. Yeah. Um, I, I think to the there there is a tendency to want like a Swiss Army knife that's going to give you, you know, th this one material solution is going to solve all of my problems, and if I can just get that, if I could get this, you know, widget or gizmo that's going to solve my problems in the electromagnetic spectrum, or this is going to make me a harder target, or my fires are going to be you know, more proficient. And, and realistically, like, the, if the practice isn't there, um, and again, the, the fundamental understanding of like, what your roles and responsibilities are, whether they're broad logistics maneuver or they're kind of a niche enabler like me, um, if, if you're unable to conceptually understand what is it like baseline level that I'm supposed to provide to my commander at any given time, then your widgets just kind of sunk cost, you know? Yeah, yeah and so, you know, the, obviously we're in a pretty big modernization window as an army. Um, you know, but we're going to go to war with the equipment we got right now, right? You Absolutely. Um, sure. So, you know, it, as, as we kind of look at that, like what, you know, what advice would you give units that are preparing for a CTC rotation and then coming out of a CTC rotation, you know, hey, in the ready pool for whatever the nation needs. Like, what advice would you give units that are preparing to come here? I'll let you start. Well, sir, I, I, would, I would just echo a lot of what you folk, the two just said. It's really important for units to focus on the fundamentals and to focus on using what they have. A lot of times units come here and they're still in a coin mentality where there's only maybe a few brigades uh, in the whole theater and they think they can get theater level assets you know, supporting them frequently, and that's just not the realistic uh, situation that's going to happen. So, you know, it's really important for units to, to not be overly reliant on uh, echelons above brigade capabilities. If they don't have the capabilities just yet, as we're doing this modernization, as, as we get the new equipment over the years, it's really important for units to focus on using what they have to the best of their ability. And that's, and that's how you're going to defeat an enemy who has these, you know, $200 solutions that they came up with in 36 hours. So, so give me some examples of some best practices um, that, that units do that are, that are pretty effective. Sir. So right now the Army has started new um, EW platoons. There's SIGINT platoons and there's EW platoons in the MI companies that are part of the BEB, the, the Brigade Engineer Brigade, uh, Battalion. And the EW platoons and the SIGINT platoons are often undermanned and under-equipped. What they do is they, they tend to uh, combine the SIGINT and the EW platoons into SU platoons. And those soup platoons have to, uh, they're, they're a brigade level asset, they're, they're part of the BEB, however they're going to be along the flots, the, the forward line of our, of our own troops, to sense and, and find the enemy. So uh, the units that have been the most successful have been able to get those units to the right place at the right time, and the units are well integrated with whoever they're, they're with. So if they're supporting the cavalry uh, uh, squadron, they, ha they have to have the sets and reps of working with the cav squadron. If, the, if it's the first time working with the cav squadron, when they're here, if, they're, if their rotation here is the first time that they, you know, see their, their um, you know, a, a trooper and they don't know the trooper's name yet or they don't know how to, you know, their uh, radio um, uh, procedures or, or, or uh, they don't have any logistical uh, plans in place yet or have those relationships built, then they're going to struggle more. They're not going to know how to, you know, how to, how to do field craft. 
um, you know, they, have, they have to be survivable along the flight. So the units that are, again, just with those fundamentals of how to, of how to um, uh, integrate those EW platoons and SIGIN platoons uh, along the front, li the front lines, uh, is, is, it's a really important service. So, and they have to be taskable to the brigade because if they're, you know, if they're basically a take on to a battalion or squadron, then they may become a battalion or squadron level uh, asset or capability and be lost in the, in the, uh, you know, at, yeah. the at the echelon they need to be served. So, you know, my, my experience is when as an afterthought we attach an enabler to a battalion, it becomes the trail in the trail platoon of the trail company uh, it never gets to, to where it needs to be and then you know for the unit that um, the parent unit that's sort of ha you know has control of it it actually becomes a burden yeah. and it's like oh great I got I got these guys with me and what do they do yeah. um, and you know it's one of the things I, I observed when I was a task force senior at National Training Center uh, you know, did it when we came through here, and then I've watched a couple units do it. You know, I think task organizing, ha having an idea of how you're going to fight that capability early, mm -hmm. uh, task organizing and habitually training early um, results in, in a much better result. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if I task organize uh, a signal electronic warfare uh, team with a CAV troop, uh, then what I have is I have a multi-int capability organically put together. And now when I task that unit, I'm not tasking it as just a, hey, can I get to this point on the ground and observe? But mm -hmm. how am I able to sense, you know, in the next level, which, which we saw this past rotation, with small UAS, with signal electronic warfare, with ground server, now I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty lethal. You're, yeah. you're layering, oh, yeah. you're, you're doing, you know, layered, reconnoitering and I, I actually had the, the luxury of being a, an EW platoon leader um, for a year before I came here um, and there were a lot of landmines like a ton of landmines planning wise uh, we mitigated a lot of that damage by um, and I was fortunate enough to have an amazing NCOIC he's in the Space Force now um, yeah. <laughs> he's in the Space Force now but he, he was awesome prior infantry sergeant first class um, very down to earth, and we had uh, early conversations about like how are we going to take this new conceptual thing and make it known to the brigade that this is what we do. And so, for the first 60 days, I was on a circuit of LPDs. That's all I did. I uh, went to anyone who would listen, right? Every sub subordinate battalion or adjacent battalion. Um, and our squadron and said, hey, this is what EW is, this is what EW does, and this is what I can provide for you as an ISR asset. And when you brief it as an ISR asset, you know, all of those battalion twos are like, okay, I understand, like, this is going to give me information, right? Yeah. I, don't, I don't need to understand, like, the, the technical aspects of what's happening, but it's an ISR asset. And the second thing we did was after that six-day window closed, was look at the LRTC, and every time someone was in the field, my platoon was rolling up to Yakima with him, right, uh, which is the, the training center at uh, JVLM. Yeah. And so... Know it well. My guys... <laughs> got a lot of time in the desert. You know, my, my soldiers hated us for it because we were in the field operating... Well, probably until you were on the backside of an NCC rotation had great results. And, and it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic, right? Yeah. Like, the, the OCs at NTC were blown away. They were like, how did you guys get the... And it's like, because we stepped on all the landmines before we got here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we worked out how we were going to get our down reps from the, you know, the brigade SEMA section. We understood what our battle drills needed to be. All of the platoon leaders that were providing my asset security hey, knew Sue, our names, you know. Sue, Sue, you know, it's funny, um, you know, when I was out at the National Training Center, you know, John Laurie was the cog at the time, and, you know, he, he's a great student of, of the combat training centers, and, and he talked about the first um, unit that won at NTC, and it was like a year and a half before a unit won a fight at the National Training Center. Mm -hmm. And one of the secrets was they task organized and practiced before they came, yeah. uh, and, and they worked out those those drills, whatever they are, beforehand, before yeah. coming. Yeah. And um, you know, I'm I'm actually 
really optimistic about the, the future. And I'm optimistic because we're seeing more units do what you said, right? And this, this last rotation, um, you know, Cav Troop with the Signal Electronic Warfare Team, Task Organized, tied with small UAS organic to the unit, tied with rehearsed fires equal, you know, Geronimo platoon yeah. minuses being on the top in one fell swoop. And if we can sure. replicate that multiple times, like, yeah. it's, a, it's a game changer for our Army because of that multi-end capability. And then something else you said, Chief, I think that's awesome, and this is for the Intel friends out there listening, and, and you hit at it, is stop asking for the exquisite, expensive thing that is four or five echelons above you. Um, it, it, when we build the collection plan with the things that are organic to the brigade or organic to the battalion or squadron, and we work out from there, um, th then we put ourselves in a place of, of you know being realistic. And so, you know, how many NAIs can we observe? Even if we had full full signal and EW, how many NAIs realistically can we observe right now? Yeah, I mean, with with the organic equipment yeah. they have, not, not a whole lot, sir. Yeah, how many? Two or three. Right. And so once we do that and we accept that, it's just about prioritization. Exactly. And exactly. So it's like, okay, I'm going to yeah. look at the most, the thing I can collect against mm -hmm. uh, and the most important thing. So one, I can collect against it. And two, it's actually important. And then all of a sudden this, this problem starts to get easier. And you guys don't have a problem with that. No. I mean, you get, Not talk well. to me about how you guys are employed. Well, so to, to, I'd like to further yeah. what you just said, just a smidge before we transition yeah. to me. As much as I love talking about myself as a warrant officer, right? <laughs> um, like any good warrant yeah, officer. Yeah, like there's there's two <laughs> things. In a pump <laughs> there's two things that I love to talk about. It's my job and myself, right? That's the the job of a, a warrant officer. But um, <laughs> but uh, so you're a new hero to a couple hundred specialists. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> so you you had mentioned this, and it's it's true. We are getting better about it. But you you had wanted you know, tips and tricks, cheat codes for the RTU. Yeah. So during LTP, um, the staff has an opportunity to kind of work out some of these kinks. And generally speaking, you know, a rotational training unit will come through with like a solid two, three days worth of like, okay, this is my Intel collection plan. This is my ISR sync matrix. These are like, and for those first couple of days, on top of, you know, the, the hurdles of getting like their systemology up, getting the pipes widened so they can receive data. Like they have a good plan. And then when logistics start to go awry and maneuver starts to go awry and the fog of war sets in, um, some of these systems and practices that they had anticipated start to kind of fall apart. The, the, in, the Intel collection Atrophy, manager, right? right? Well, I mean, and considering like the brigade intelligence support element, like that, that's just a couple soldiers. You know, you've got one intelligence collection manager. His hair is going to be on fire. The, the duration of a rotation. So what's funny, uh, I, would, I would disagree, because I think the Brigade 3 is actually <laughs> who's worse, because it's an operation. Right, right. right. Which is, a, which, you know, and I'll give the mic back to you here in a second. We can do anything once well, and so we can build the perfect mousetrap intel collection plan do that one time and in most of our training that's what we're trained towards we're not trained to have to do this continually and so it's 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 like going out and running a hundred meter race right versus running a marathon and how do you run at a pace that's realistic for a marathon and so the collection plan one it is is I think it's the brigade three I mean the it's an operation and so you know when we start from the squadron the organic assets of the brigade, infantry uh, scout platoons, or battalion scout platoons, infantry companies, organic small UAS, shadow UAS, and, and we build it with, we start with that, and it's, okay, we have requirements. Intel says, hey, these are the NAIs we should be looking at, these are the IRs that we have to answer. Well, the Brigade 3, like, helps the commander, like, prioritize it, says, okay, hey, there's, there's 100 things that we want to look at. We can look at 20. So we're going to look at the 20 most important things. Um, and when we start to prioritize it, then we end up with a plan that's actually simple and that's executable. 
And so that's, I think, part of where this gets off the rails is like we have big eyes for what we want to do when in reality we just have to simplify things and say, okay, it would be great if I could look at everything. Sure. I can. I can look at 20 things. If I'm going to look at them with a primary or alternate observer, I'm going to do it multi-day, right? Because that's what you guys do exceedingly well is you prioritize and there's nothing that's looked at by one collection type. At, at least we, we, we try not to. Um, right. and, and what could assist with that, we don't have them anymore officially, but what, what I've seen more than once is units will establish like an ad hoc S9 or Intel, um, an information environment working group. Yeah. Right? Well, they'll pick somebody to be in charge of this thing and then assist the three. Like here's all of these variables that are kind of you know, free radicals flapping around in the wind that we're trying to tie down. Um, and in conjunction with but, I mean, the it, two and the three. It's a and, function we have to do. Yes. It's just merely assigning responsibility to yes. those functions and acknowledging it. I mean, whether it's we have a staff position for it or we split up those responsibilities and assign them very clearly, as you said at the kind of beginning, it's a clear understanding of who has what roles and responsibilities. And then being prepared to branch when things go awry. Because they, they will. Things are going to deteriorate very rapidly. And, like, I mean, comms by itself. There, there is not a worse combination of conditions that I could fathom that are going to make just communicating more of a nightmare than the swamps of Fort Johnson, Louisiana. Yeah. Like it's, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, and you know, pile on top of that, trying to do mounted maneuver. <laughs> I mean, even dismounted maneuver is really difficult out here. Yeah. Um, and and so, coupled with vegetation, that makes it's tough. It's really tough. And so all of these things, you know, are happening and like these initial sets that they have for the first couple of days, when those collapse, like what are you doing now with your enablers? And so I think, and again, major plan hit it, like they're getting significantly better at it, being able to branch and, you know, kind of recalibrate their, their niche enablers down on the plot. Um, but if you don't have at least an idea of how to communicate new um, you know, PIRs or CCIRs down to your collection asset, it's going to make your life more difficult than it needs to be. Well, and I think you know, what, what, I've, what I've learned of watching this here, and, and you know, informed by sort of like the lessons I had from, from being a Task Force senior out in the desert, time in brigade command, getting to practice it, and then, and then really kind of here is um, I'd rather have, and you, you, as you kind of laid out, you know, your role as a platoon leader, I'd rather have a good plan that has a lot of sets and reps um, at doing very fundamental things of like, hey, I, you know, this signal electronic warfare team always works with this platoon. Mm -hmm. They know where they are in the order of march. They know how we do resupply. They know how we report primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. Um, that platoon understands the power requirements of this element. They under it, when that good plan has a bunch of repetition, that it becomes dependable. I'll take that over the perfect plan that we've never practiced. Sure. And I think that that is the name of the game of this. Is like, okay, stop trying to hit home runs and just hit base runs consistently, um, because that. You know, over time, when we do that really, really well, it means that we're going to be able to report rapidly. That information is going to go to the right place. It's going to be analyzed and passed to the brigade at the right pace and echelon. And then we're going to get timely and accurate fires to destroy that target. Yes, sir. Um, so, or to enable a, a critical decision on the DSM. Yeah, I'd definitely say, sir, during the rotations I've seen, the trends are definitely getting better. And I would say that you know, every rotation is my favorite rotation because everyone you, you can see that the units are just getting better. Yeah. You know, sporadically there were there were, there were, there were a lot of a lot of strengths in the past. Um, I was actually the DTAC in Tenth Mountain, uh, the business staff for your rotation you said. I, I do remember your EW platoon calling for fire on. I was drawn. I might have been a decoy command post. I don't remember what it was, but I remember that pretty well. So those all it's pretty well. Simple, yeah. Simple fundamentals executed. And. Um, you know, and, and I thought what we what we did was a good start. You know, Army's, you know, I came through here two years ago. Army has gotten better. Now, some units, like, clearly 
haven't had the, the education program that you provided. But the units that have, you can tell. Because it's they're just, they're fine in Geronimo, they're tying it with fires, and they are killing. Um, but you brought up something really important is, you know, for for non EW leaders out there, you gotta get educated on this. You gotta understand the capabilities and limitations that this can apply. And you know, something that came up earlier, you can't complain about what we don't have. Like we have what we have. How do we use that right now to maximum effect? Um, and I think to your point, it's it's twofold. It's it's one, it's you know, leaders have to, to be open to being educated. They need to seek out education uh, on the capabilities. And then two, it takes EW leaders going out and spreading the good word. Right. Um, education campaigns, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, being honest about, hey, this is what we can do and this is what we can't do. Yes. And these are the requirements to enable us to get the effects that we want. Um, you know, there's no, there's no secret sauce and there's no magic widget out there that's going to win the war. Um, but, you know, the, the combination of capabilities together, I think, makes us pretty lethal. So let's get back to talking about you. Okay. All right, what, what, are, you, you know, what are you most proud of that you've been doing to RTU? <laughs> give them some feedback of what they can do to make themselves uh, a harder target. So uh, I am um, the electronic warfare technician for the, the Spectre cell of Geronimo. Um, and our, <laughs> our mission is really, our mission is Dark, really nefarious twofold. Organization. Yeah, Spectre. Um, <laughs> but our, our mission is really uh, twofold. And, and we have kind of two like wings of Spectre that you know come together to, to make these things happen. We're a very small team, um, which has inherent advantages um, because nothing is compartmentalized. That's flat. Um, it's completely flat, and we own all information-related capabilities. is is a team of nine people. You know, so that's that's drones, that's EW, that's you know information warfare, that's space. It's just nine of us, and I think that's awesome. Um, it it's hectic and difficult because there's only nine of us. Um, but I think there's, again, there's inherent advantages to, to it being completely flat. And so our, our first primary responsibility is to uh, emulate realistic threats in space, cyberspace, and the electromagnetic spectrum. Th that's, that's key number one. You know? So the information environment, propaganda, um, you know, social media interaction, uh, that's, that's one of our responsibilities. Having yeah, and ultimately this is, is so that we create a signature. Right. It's, rotational it's all able about, to, to yes. And collect. It's all about, and, and we're getting significantly better about, I mean, it, like every rotation, we're adding more and more stuff. Um, my, my vision is to eventually have the JRTC be like the most desirable training center for any, not just infantry units or air, right. light infantry units, but everybody wants to come here and train. Um, you, me, General Gardner, yes. we all have the same vision of this. Thing. And I, and I think we, we accomplished that um, by presenting unique and interesting signatures where, you know, like a tank is an obvious maneuver signature, but what about like a weird computer on a network that's doing odd things, right? Like RTUs have a desire to affect cyberspace or affect the EMA. Like the, the desire is there. They reach out and they, they request training support from units that are you know, prepared to facilitate that kind of targeting. Um, and they're almost always you know, not approved, these requests. And it's very sad because it's like they, they understand that the, the planning considerations exist, you know? Um, and I am doing my best to yeah. present as much as I possibly can yeah. out there. Now, now, some of this, too, is like uh, I don't have F, we don't have F-35s that fly here every month. No. Right? I don't, we don't have to. No. Right? Because we can, you know, if, if the brigade, uh, you know, executes the right behaviors, participates in the ATO cycle, does the right targeting, they request the capability, we can replicate that capability. It doesn't really matter that I don't have an F-35 flying overhead. I can replicate it. Yes. And a big part of what we do is replicate effects. Constructive assets. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, but in, in terms of, you know, what, what Spectre, what we have, what we bring, um, I've got an information operations officer, 04. Um, we have a space operations officer who's kind of like the, the senior technical advisor to the staff. 
um, myself, and that comprises the, the fusion section, like the, the information-related synchronization section that we're, or, or I guess, portion of, of Spectre. And then the rest of our team is all EW operators. Um, and so we kind of formulate, and I'll, I'll float in between. Like odds are, on any given night, Chief Lair will be out in the box doing some EW wizardry, right? Um, but we, we've, we've gotten very proficient at um, analyzing what is the RTU bringing and really doing like that cog analysis of, okay, what do they really require right now? Um, can I affect it? What do I have to affect it with? And is it more important for them to, to have you know, this, this node in their communications chain um, for me to either want to exploit that or herd them completely onto that one capability? If I can take everything else away. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of. When you put all the, need when, when you put all the needles in one place, yes. it's easier to find the needles. So, so our, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't keep any secrets. There's no trade secrets to, to Geronimo, you know, Electronic Warfare or Spectre. Like I, in fact, will reach out to RTU, SEMA, the, the cyber electromagnetic activity sections, and say, hey, what are your training objectives? You know, is there anything that we can help you do? Because I, I am very passionate about getting the Army better at this. Um, but my so baseline that's tip one is like reach out to Chief Lawyer yeah, and Geronimo. Absolutely. And, 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 and let, we'll pull the curtain back, yeah. And let me know what you want to see, and I will do my best within, within reason to facilitate that signature that you want to see. Um, and it's got to be, you know, tactically relevant. You know, I'm not going to just turn a jammer on, like, at your brigade talk, right? It needs to support my, my commander's intent is go, always going to trump, you know, what the RTU wants to do. Um, but my, my baseline TTP is going to the box. Uh, one, I need to understand what it is they're doing. So I have some pieces of equipment that allow me to kind of visualize their, their electromagnetic footprint. Um, so I'm able to kind of, within 24 to 48 hours, I know what a brigade is relying on communications-wise. Um, and then I'll go back and kind of debrief our, uh, our command team and our, our you know, primarily just the Spectre so you get OIC. The, you get the electromagnetic order of battle. Right, right. And, um, you know, th this is information that is, like, it's available, um, you know, and, and, like, RTUs, should they be going, you know, if, if we were to go to theater tomorrow, like, there's data out there. So um, you can... You can pull that stuff. And that, that is incumbent upon, really, the, the SEMA planner at any brigade to put together for their command team. It's like, this is what we anticipate. Um, and once I have that information, now I, now I start kind of you know, conniving. It's like, OK. Um, term. Right, Dive. right. <laughs> well, OK, so doctrinally, I'm, re I'm required to, I'm required to you know, deny, degrade, disrupt, or destroy mm -hmm. using you know, directed energy. Like, that's, that's the definition of electronic warfare, electromagnetic Which warfare, right? So I want to I wanna deny, degrade, disrupt, or destroy. Um, and I don't always have, you know, it's almost, it's, it's sometimes sad. Um, I sat through a, uh, it's like a capability development meeting um, last year, and uh, there was an individual on the meeting that was like, yeah, you know, Op4 at CTCs, they've got, all this crazy technology, and you know, they're they're so they're eons ahead of. I I had to inform him that that was that was not true. Most of my equipment is from like 2012, um, and it it was designed to operate in a completely different theater. Uh, what we are good at, like we we talked about early in the conversation, is we're we're good at putting these pieces of equipment and basically maximizing their their effectivity in the environment that we're in. Um, but in, in order to you do are that, masters of your equipment. I, I would like to think so. And sometimes we have the luxury of being able to like create something unique for each rotation. So if I if I am able to determine that a unit is incredibly reliant on, you know, one specific piece of, of comms equipment, and I can develop a solution that's able to collect on or collect as it's not the, the right term. Uh, I'm a title sense. ten. I'm a sense, right? I'm a title ten operator. I don't want to offend any Intel people, um, but it just grammatically makes more sense. Anyway, sense. Yeah. Um, if I can sense your primary, um, and as a title ten operator, my really, my only job is to see where something is and pass that information to a decision maker. I'm not concerned with what's being said. 
I don't care if it's encrypted or not. I, I don't care about the contents within any of that traffic. I just want to know where it is and whether or not it's on. So uh, Major Plant can, can talk about MCON and the importance of emissions control. Um, but all of this is to say, if you have something that's emitting a signal, my job and, and what I'm good at is finding those things. And there is, there is not a single piece of equipment that you can rely on that is truly you know, low probability of detection. Low probability of intercept and low probability of detection is like, that's yeah. two different. Right, they're, they're, there's they're no, there is no yeah. such yeah. thing. Yeah. Like, if you turn a radio yeah. on, it's going to do something. Right, you know? and so you know, this is central to large-scale combat operations in the 21st century. Absolutely. The transparency of the bottom of it. I mean, the bottom line is, like, if, if, you're, if it has power, we can find it. Right. And, and, doing, and doing the environmental analysis and understanding, like, obviously, you know, a brigade is going to have a completely different um, silhouette in the EMS in an urban environment as opposed to right. the JRTC. You know, right. if you're bringing a bunch of sophisticated communications equipment out in the middle of the woods, odds are I can find you. And, and, that's, and that's a planning factor, yeah. right? Like, we have to, like, understanding your environment is important. And then understanding how do I mitigate as much as possible the odds of someone finding me. And that's when we start talking about emissions control plans and like yeah. what that means for a staff. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, MCON stands for emission control. And uh, we in the EW community have been kind of jumping up and down about the importance of this in Lesco for the last several years. And um, I really appreciate, you know, the, the uh, the leadership between you and, and General Gardner the last few rotations, we've been able to, to implement what we call MCON events, where we tell the RTU, hey, the enemy, the enemy DTG, the enemy, the enemy Division Tactical Group has layered sensors that they're going to pair with mass fires. We don't, we don't specify what the sensors are. Doesn't matter. Right? It's, exactly, sir. It's, we're saying that they cannot uh, interdict those, sens those sensors. Right? They're, they're there, so uh, they just have to be able to hide from them, basically. So, uh, and this, by the way, is like, re I mean, this is realistic. Like, it, it, Every major power has the capability to, to sense it. Yes, sir. Everything inside a brigade and below. 100%, right. sir. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, there's, there's, it's, it can be from uh, layered sensors, or it can be space based, cyber yeah. based, um, ground based. You know, Chief Lee was talking about, he, has, he brought some of his, uh, his equipment here that he you know, built at low, cap, low cost very quickly just to, to find the RT signals because we said you know, those signals are stealth. Uh, but anyway, for these emission control events, um, we've We've really seen in just a few rotations. The first one was in January, so we, had, we, we just had a few so far, and they're all just uh, growing very quickly. You know, the the, um, the improvement is just, I've seen has just been really staggering and, and uh, profound over the last few rotations. Which I mean, it is so important, right? It is like, sir, yeah, because I mean, it's the it's the proof that one we can do this. Like this is can. not we impossible can. to do, yeah. and it, and it's not you know. Uh, the radical improvement of units has not been a uh, technology solution. Exactly, sir. Yeah, <laughs> we have to focus on the fundamentals, like we were saying before. Where if we don't have these technological solutions, we have to innovate with TTPs or you know, just follow doctrine and uh, you know, proper survival techniques uh, in order to survive. And just the, the change in, in how long it takes some units to displace their CPs and turn everything off and go to a uh, higher uh, emission control. Protection level is it's just it's staggering how quickly they they've, they've improved. Um, they can do other other uh, things, of course, for to improve their MCON. We've seen that change as well, sir. Where uh, the Op Four has said, "Hey, certain units, um, we we know that they've been using the low power levels. They, yeah. they have not had their communication systems on max power. Um, we know some units have uh, you know, have had better discipline at the along the along the." Yeah, the, using the using things. brevity, using right? Brevity using X checks is right. huge. Things like that. There's there's other things they can do for the command boost. They can displace their antennas. They can turn their power levels down. They can use some terrain masking. You know, if there's a, a, a wooded you know, woods or, or a hill or a wooded hill in front of you, maybe that's better so the enemy can't see you as easily. But um, yeah, it's, it's it's really it's really uh, great to see, sir, how, how the improvements been with the last few uh, rotations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll close out with closing comments. I'll let you. Uh, have some closing words, and then you. What you know? What kind of final thoughts for units out there to, to come and, and, and fight in this environment and, and get better? Um, I would say train early, 
train often and integrate your enablers as often as you possibly can. Um, understand what each of these things brings uh, at, at baseline level. And I think at a minimum, platoon leaders and above should be cognizant of what each of these weird reconnoitering enablers can, can bring. So these are crazy. I don't think they're weird because, you know, I think the reality is like some of this is back to the future. These are some of these are capabilities that had we had from the 80s. Yeah. From right. the 80s. Yeah. Um, and here we are in, in 2021 or 2023, the 21st century. Everybody's got, um, you know, everybody's carrying around multiple electronic devices. Like in, in this day and age, like we, we just sort of owe it to if you're going to understand how to read terrain, you better understand how to read the electromagnetic uh, spectrum as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, for my final thoughts, sir, I, I would really uh, you know, echo that and just kind of summarize everything that we said uh, you know, along those lines. You know, it's really important to have emission control for survivability in, in, in less scale and large scale combat operations. If we focus on jamming, that's, that's, you're, you know, it's good, but you're, you're presenting a big target, so it's important to focus on the basics of what you have right now with you know, your, using your equipment uh, in the most effective, most survivable manner with emission control. Um, you, you know, have your have your next jump plan. Know where you're moving to. Do the yeah, analysis, the tra tra plan. terrain analysis. Know know, know uh, you know where you're, uh, where you're going. Uh, rehearse you know uh, breaking down your command posts and, and being able to move quickly. You know know it. You know know the, exactly the uh, the details of, of how it's going to operate. So five minutes and twenty four seconds. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Battalion last rotation. Yeah. Tore down a command post in five minutes and twenty four seconds. Transition. And I'll say, in the first time we did this in January, sir, we were. There, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hours. There were hours, and there was there was some sentiment from some folks that they, that we should give them more time. That hours was not enough. Yeah. Or you know the the, the, the number of hours we gave them was not enough. So, um, just like you said, we can do this. We just we have yeah. to be able to do it. Uh, you know, we have to we have to be hard on the RTUs to a degree where we, um, you know, make it a little discomfort discomfortable for them, and then uh, you know that'll that'll be the stimulus needed to. Develop the TTPs we need as an army. Yeah, so I mean, I'd say number one, like just a reminder that combat is Darwinian, right? And you know, those that evolve fastest live, yes, sir. right? And you know, I, I, uh, you know, your team, I think, you know, both teams, I think, have done a phenomenal job of coaching and and, and mentoring people um, to to get to a place where they're learning faster. Um, you know, the second, and what I'm looking for, and sort of my challenge out there is. You can maneuver um, a formation, I, you know, night infiltration battalion. You could do it without can of hand mic. Uh, it's hard, uh, but it can be done. Yeah. Um, you can certainly maneuver a company. And I'm looking for a battalion uh, to go black, uh, maneuver uh, without can of hand mic, without emitting at all, uh, show up at a time and place unexpected by Geronimo at a position of advantage. Because it can be done. Sir. Um, it's just gonna. It takes a ton of discipline. It takes some practice. Uh, it takes an awareness of the environment that you're actually in. Um, and I think you know, somebody's gonna do it. I mean, I, I'm confident. Before I leave here, somebody's gonna do it, and, and it, I think it's gonna be a game changer. But I think it gets to you know, step one is understand the environment. Step two is what's in the realm of possible, and then it's that simple plans that are practiced over and over again is really going to result in the unit being able to kind of surprise, um, you know, in, in this environment, Geronimo. Appreciate what you're doing. You know, appreciate the innovation. You, you brought some toys. Yeah, we ran out of time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's hey, unfortunate. We'll, we'll, do a, we'll do another episode. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, you and your team, uh, by being masters of the fundamentals, are really pressing our Army to get better faster. And, and that's, what, that's what we paid Geronimo to do. Uh, there is no, there is no cheat code. There is no hack. There is no secret sauce. It's just doing the thing. And if you're interested in joining uh, Chief Lair's team or his punk rock band, uh, <laughs> reach out. Uh, come join us down here. Uh, greatly appreciate your time. I appreciate what you do for Army. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you for joining us on the Crucible, the JRTC experience. The Joint Readiness Training Center is the premier crucible training experience. We prepare units to fight and win in the most complex environments against world-class opposing forces. We are America's leadership laboratory. Again, we'd like to thank our guests for participating. This podcast was created and produced by Mr. John Mabes. It was recorded and edited by Chief Thomas Rich and researched by First Lieutenant Anthony Cho. 
Intro vocals were done by Mr. Robert Chopper. Special thanks to Captain Jermaine Branch and Mr. Jeff England from Public Affairs. Be sure to like and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest warfighting TTPs learned through the crucible that is the Joint Readiness Training Center. Follow us by going to https colon forward slash forward slash l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e forward slash j-r-t-c. We'd like to thank our partners at the Center for Army Lessons Learned of the Combined Arms Center, especially the JRTC Call Observations Detachment. Be sure to follow them on social media as well. Follow them at https colon forward slash forward slash www.army.mil forward slash C-A-L-L. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and review us wherever you listen or watch your podcasts, and be sure to stay tuned for more in the near future. The Crucible, the JRTC experience, is a product of the Joint Readiness Training Center.